Good morning. Welcome to the Texas A&M College of Veterinary Science and Biomedical Sciences Peer Programs Continuing Video Conference Series. This morning, we'll be talking with some veterinary technicians about the pathway to becoming a veterinary technician and some of the activities they do in their careers. This morning, we have with us Caleb Corsi, Holly Callis, Lauren Minner, and Juan Torres. So at this point, we are going to begin our program, and Caleb will let you get started. Good morning. So kind of getting started, there's, there's a lot of a lot of things veterinary technicians do, there's a lot of things that they can be compared to, but in reality it's, it's kind of a standalone deal. We, we do a lot of things from assisting doctors do exams to giving vaccinations, helping in surgery, um, anesthesia, radiology, we, we kind of do it all. And there's a, a lot that goes with that, a lot of school that goes with that, but it, it is very rewarding to do. Um, things we do, um, take care of the case, we look at records, get histories of the animal, um, do laboratory work, getting samples and specimens, specialized nursing care, anything from basic care to ICU care, um, prepare for surgery, um, assist in medical cases, assist in surgery, there will be times you know, that we'll scrub in to help the, help the surgeon. I'm going to take x-rays, which Holly's going to talk about in a little while, um, and supervising and training other technicians and other staff. And then, of course, stocking, cleaning, that all kind of goes with the territory. A little bit of the education involved with it. Most of the veterinary technology programs are a two-year degree, so you'll get an associate's. Um, there are 191 veterinary technology programs in the U.S. currently accredited by the AVMA. Um, there are quite a few of those that are that are going that are not accredited, but probably will be. There's also different ways to take the class. You can do traditional um, college classes where you'll go, you know, go to school for two years. There's also programs like I'm currently in that are all distance learning, so everything's done online. Um, that that's worked out very well for me because I work full time, so I can do class whenever whenever I have time. Um, after you finish school, you'll sit for the VT&E, or the Veterinary Technical National Exam, and then depending on what state you're in, you may also have a state exam that you'll have to take. Texas, you'll have a state exam. Um, I think Oklahoma has one. Um, once you've done that, you will gain status as a registered veterinary technician. Um, they're actually in, in the process of changing that a little bit to where you'll actually be a licensed veterinary technician instead of a registration. Outlooks for the career, um, by the end of the decade, they're expecting a 52% growth, so it's very in demand right now. Uh, one of the top 10 growing occupations in, in the entire US. And there, there seems to be an increase in, in demand for things other than working at a clinic. That's just one aspect of it. You have you know, public health, there's uh, CDC, disease control, and as well as research that are all okay. options that you can, can go into. Career field, can do large and small animal. You can do exotics, you can be mixed, you can work zoos. Really, there, there's no limit to what you can do. Um, some of us like to specialize. I, I personally specialize in, in anesthesia. Um, we do small and large animal. And once you finish you know, school, there's options where you can go on and become certified in, in, um, in anesthesia or radiology or, or surgery. Um, again, exotics and zoos, those jobs are a little harder to come by because people love them so much. Once you get there, people don't leave. Uh, research in laboratories here at A&M, we have several research facilities, um, several, several laboratories, and know quite a few techs that, that do work in there as well. And then the educational side, which is what we all do, um, you know, teaching the first through fourth year vet students um, with their clinical portion of, of school. Uh, animal shelters and rescue, you know, there are technicians that become animal control officers that handle, you know, that work with rescue groups. Disasters and emergency response, this is actually another, another group that I'm interested in is the uh, veterinary emergency team here at A&M where we deploy to natural and man-made disasters to 
handle the, the animal aspect of it as far as evacuation and care when there's no, you know, all the veterinary clinics are, are closed or can't handle what, what the caseload would be. Food safety is another one, so working with the USDA or the Department of Health, um, ensuring that livestock are cared for, that, you know, the, the food chain stays safe. Um, some of the specializa specializations that you can do after you complete technician school, um, anesthesia, surgery, internal medicine, dental is a new one, um, emergency critical care, behavior, zoo med, um, equine, clinical practice, and nutrition. Um, most of these also have a subspecialty in either small or large animals, so you have the option to really specialize with what you want to do and, and make your career what you want it to be. Alright guys, my name is Holly Callis. I've been a registered vet tech for 11 years now. Um, I work in radiology. I've been a radiology vet tech for nine years, um, which is what I've always done. I've uh, worked four years at the University of Missouri in radiology and I've been at A&M for five years in radiology. I have now a bachelor's in diagnostic imaging with an emphasis in MRI, which I completed in the human field because they don't offer that in the veterinary aspect of it. Some of the things that I do in a day-to-day -day basis, uh, place orders for nuclear medicine cases. I, I perform personally CTs, MRIs, um, radiology exams such as radiographs uh, and fluoroscopy on large and small animals. Um, I'm required to set up machines and the protocols. I create those. Uh, position patients for radiographs, uh, do post-processing of images for uh, MRIs and CTs, and I also instruct senior veterinary students on um, how to position and take radiographs, in which I've also brought some uh, props to show you just some of the things that, that we use. Um, we are required to wear lead. Um, these are some of the not finer lead gloves that we wear, but you're always required to wear lead gloves. Um, and then we also have lead gowns that you're required to wear. And uh, most of them are just uh, little strap-on Velcros, and then a lot of them come with um, uh, thyroid shields, because we are required to protect our thyroids as well. Um, and they're, they can get kind of heavy sometimes. Um, patient positioning. Um, we'd like to try to be as hands-off as we can. Sometimes that doesn't work, but for like sedated patients, we like to use sandbags. Works really well. Um, tape works wonderfully. And then for, um, say, if you need to put them on their backs, we use little, just simple foam pads um, that work really well. So those are just some of the things that we use when doing uh, radiographs and things like that. So back into some of the special things that I do, nuclear medicine scans, what these are, are scans that we do to detect lamenesses, things that aren't obvious on physical examination. So we inject a radioactive isotope, which is a radiopharmaceutical. The most common one we use is uh, technesium, and we administer that IV, we let it um, absorb into the animal for about two hours and then we take them into our nuclear medicine room where we scan them with a gamma camera and um, the this is different than radiology because the animal is actually emitting the radioactivity not the camera we also do therapeutic I-131 iodine treatments for hyperthyroid animals MR and CT is another thing that I do. I personally like CT the best, even though I did get my specialization in MRI. Um, most of my animals for CT and MR are completely anesthetized, but we have developed a way to do heavily sedated animals for quick scans like shoulders and elbows for orthopedics and um, patients that aren't very stable. We put them in what we call a mouse trap. There's a picture of our mouse trap right there. Completely awake, we just cover, cover them in this plastic tube and usually they sit pretty still for these scans. Um, it's pretty remarkable. Our MRI is all
also a complete different aspect. It is non-ionizing, which makes it much more, uh, much safer for the animals. It doesn't emit radiation. So we try to use MRI uh, a lot more than CT or radiographs. And the uh, quality of images is much better. Usually, like I said, patients are awake, so we have to restrain them with sandbags and tape and ourselves. We just do single images obtained um, using the x-rays. So I have a little slideshow I wanted to show you guys. This is in our new imaging facility, and we have the capability of doing CTs and MRIs on horses. And so this is just a little picture by picture that I wanted to show you of how we do this. Usually it takes four to five people. We will heavily sedate the horses for CT, MRI, they're completely anesthetized. Um, we drop them on the ground in a completely padded room, put hobbles around their legs, as you can see, and hoist them up and put them on this uh, gigantic round table. Um, we wheel them into our CT room. You can see there we're, we're wheeling him in. Um, and then we dock in right next to the gantry of the CT. And <clears throat> as you can see, we're set up. We tie the front legs backwards and uh, get all of our monitoring set up. So here's a picture of us actually scanning the horse. Um, I'm running the machine, and there's my radiologist with me. And these are real quick uh, scans. So we, once we're finished, these take about, oh, talks of 15 minutes by the time we drop them, scan them, and get them back into recovery. And then this last picture is us hoisting the horse up off the table and taking him, taking him back into recovery. Hi guys, my name is Lauren Minner. Um, I'm a general surgery technician at Texas A&M. I also have an associate's degree um, in applied science in veterinary technology. I'm as well a um, registered veterinary technician. I just completed my certification a few months ago, so that means I did go to a two-year university in Denver, Colorado, which is Bell Ray. And then I also took my national exam and state exam and passed those. As a general surgery technician, we do um, a few different procedures on client-owned animals and also animals from area shelters. We'll do elective procedures such as spays, neuters, C-sections on pregnant animals, gastropexies, declaws, mass removals, the occasional amputation, and um, other elective procedures as they come along. I assist fourth year veterinary students in the different um, exams and such that is required for the patients to go to surgery. Um, in general surgery, about half of our business is with the animal shelters in the area. We go ahead and perform their spays and neuters on the patients that need to be adopted out just so once the animals are adopted out, they are spayed and neutered. The responsibilities of a general surgery technician like myself is, like I said, assisting the students with preoperative exams, whether that just be a complete physical or collecting samples and sending them to make sure that the patient is healthy and ready for anesthesia and surgery. Um, I assist them with pre-medicating the patients, which normally entails intramuscular injections of pharmaceuticals to make sure that they are ready for surgery. I will help them induce the patients into anesthesia and also prep them for surgery. Um, I brought a few um, instruments to show you guys. So as you can see in that picture there, we're getting ready to intubate this dog for surgery. So this right here is laryngoscope. We use this to hold down their tongue and visualize the arytenoids so we can go ahead and intubate them. This is one of our larger endotracheal tubes. We'll use this to maintain their airway during surgery and make sure that they can breathe, everything like that. And then this right here is just a stethoscope that we can use to monitor their breathing and their heart rate under anesthesia as well. So once the patients are under anesthesia, we will go ahead and monitor them, uh, make sure that everything is going well, make sure that they're doing fine under anesthesia, everything like that. We'll monitor their breathing, their heart rate, their blood pressure, their um, pulse oxes, everything like that. That right there is a picture of a patient under anesthesia. They're getting ready to go into surgery. Once they are done with surgery, I will assist the fourth years in rolling them back into recovery, making sure that they wake up properly and without any problems.
Hi, uh, my name is Juan Torres, and I uh, am a resident veterinary technician, just like Lauren. And again, like Lauren, I just recently got my certification a few months ago. Uh, I got my bachelor's degree in biomedical science from Texas A&M in 2011. And while I was doing my undergraduate there, I worked at the Texas A&M Veterinary Hospital as a technician. And when I graduated, I figured out that's what I wanted to do as a career. So I went to the local veterinary technician school here at Blinn, the community college, got my degree this past year and again I passed the boards with uh, Lauren at the same time and so I've been a registered veterinary technician for about six months now so and uh, the picture here with me that's a patient that we had a few weeks ago he uh, unfortunately he had a, what we call an AA subluxation which is a short for atlantoaxial subluxation which is pretty much the first two vertebrae in the spine become kind of dislocated so we have to bandage him up like that for the next few weeks. So pretty much he has to keep his head straight at all times. So we have to put a little splint all around on the back of his neck and on the front, keep him like that, and then we just wrap him up like that. It's pretty fun, kind of cute, but sad for him. So in neurology, which is the department that I work in, we do uh, several different testing. Uh, for a neuro neurologic test, we do something called proprioception testing, which is just a fancy word for having the animal know where his or her feet are. So we'll have them stand up and we'll kind of flip their paws over and see if they can like flip it back by themselves so they know that their foot is placed improperly. Um, reflexes, uh, which is what we're doing on the ground there, is the same thing whenever you go to a doctor for a checkup, you sit on a chair and then they kind of tap on me with a little fleximeter, which is my little prop here. It's the same exact thing. You tap them and see if they get a reflex, let them know that everything neurologically is going okay with them. Uh, we'll palpate their spine for pain and their neck for pain. So we'll just kind of go along and press along their spine and see if they have any, again, any abrupt pain and see if everything's going fine with there. And with passive range of motion, we'll, that's uh, something we use as a rehabilitation technique. We'll kind of lay them on their side and put their feet in a range of motion and we'll make it look in a walking motion and see, help them uh, build up their muscle and get them back to where they would be walking normally. Uh, also, what we do, we get collect samples just like Lauren does. Uh, we do blood draws, ice their surgery incisions after they have surgery, ultrasound their bladder, which is what we're doing here. Uh, for some of these dogs that have back injuries, back surgeries, sometimes afterwards they don't have uh, control of their urination. Sometimes they won't be able to urinate, so we have to do that for them. So we'll have to express their bladder, just nice and gentle pressure, and have them go by themselves. And if necessary, we'll have to instruct clients how to do the same thing so they can do it at home. Uh, Cystocentesis, what we're doing there again is we're, we'll get a urine sample, we'll lay them on their back or their side, and we get a needle and we stick into the bladder to get a urine sample. Uh, something else to do, we assist the fourth year students with getting medications, we instruct them how to do neurologic exams, uh, help them with patient care, and make sure everything is going well with the patient. Uh, besides being a neurologic technician, I'm also a floater technician, which means that I also cover other services whenever their head technician is out. I assist in orthopedic surgery, soft tissue surgery, general surgery, which is what Lauren does, and rehabilitation. And this little pup here is getting uh, water treadmill therapy. So this will go, so water treadmill therapy is something that is a big thing we do at Texas A&M for rehab. And these animals will range from orthopedic animals that had orthopedic surgeries or neurologic surgeries, where they need to learn how to build up muscle again or kind of just help them learn how to walk again. We'll put them in the water treadmill and it assists them by taking a lot of weight off of them so they can be able to move their legs, build that muscle back up, and get them back to walking normally. Caleb, we didn't get a chance to hear what it is that you do at the teaching hospital. So if you'd like to give us a rundown on, on what your position is right now, what your jobs are? Sure. Um, I'm the small animal anesthesia team leader. So my job entails helping third and fourth year students with anesthesia. Um, it's, they're generally pretty complex cases that require you know some really intense care. Um, and we have a staff of about 13 and that, that run cases. We do small animal, large animal, and exotics, whatever, whatever comes in, we will sleep it. So we're a pretty integral part of, of surgery to, to keep their service services going, but we also you know, help with imaging, we do internal medicine, neurology, we, we work for essentially all the services to, to provide anesthesia. Um, and like I said, I've been at the vet school since 2003, took a little break for a couple of years, but I'm back um, 
doing anesthesia, really, really enjoy it. Um, and, and like I said, it's the, the hours are long and we're very busy, but, but it's very rewarding to know that, that every day it's something a little bit different. We don't, don't do the same thing day in, day out. Thank you, Caleb. And before you leave, now you're in the process of getting your certification right now, that's correct? Correct. And are you going to have to get an additional certification or a specialization to continue in the anesthesiology field? So uh, one of the reasons I, I decided to pursue tech school is, is actually in the state of Texas, there's, there's some laws that are changing that are gonna drastically change how veterinary technicians work. And, and that's a lot of those are, are not just in Texas, but in the, in the US as a whole. That was one of the reasons I decided to go back to school, but also there is a specialty certification in anesthesia that I really want to do, and that's that's one of the, the goals I have personally is to, just to become a, a technician specialist in anesthesia, um, just to just to pers you know provide more knowledge to, to myself and as well the students. They'll take take me a little bit further. And what will you have to do to, to reach that goal? So after I finish my tech school, and, and again I'm I'm doing the distance learning program. It, it works out better for me. I have a family, so it, it's, it's hard to go to class and work full time. Um, once I finish that, after that, I'll have three years to complete a case log. Um, I have to work, you know, that they have requirements for so many hours you have to work, so many types of cases you have to do, you have to present the cases. Um, once you get all that done, you'll sit for the, for the specialty exam, which is a pretty rigorous all day exam that that test you in knowledge from everything from small to large to exotic anesthesia, um, similar to what, what a human nurse anesthetist would have to take. And after that, you know, when you complete that and pass that, then you can call yourself a technician specialist in anesthesia. Okay, so beyond providing superior knowledge for yourself, your clients and the students, is this beneficial in your career ladder? Is this gonna? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. This will take, you know, there are very few people um, in Texas, I know of a handful of people that have a technician specialty in anesthesia. Um, again, there, like we talked about earlier, there are several different groups you can you can get a specialty in. Um, emergency, critical care, dermatology, you name it, there is one. Um, but but there are only a handful in Texas, and there's probably less than 200 in the U.S. So it's it's kind of one of those things that if you if you do have a specialty and you are certified in that specialty your job market really opens up and, and you can pretty much go anywhere you want. People will hunt you down to, to hire you. And I know this isn't always a, the perfect social con uh, conversation to have, but what about your pay grade? Does this I, impact your it, pay grade? It will impact pay grade, um, especially when you get people from other facilities, other universities, you know, trying to get you to come work for them. It gives you a little bit of, of bartering mm -hmm. ability that, that you can work with. I like Texas A&M, I'll probably never leave, so I, so that, that's not in it for me, it's just, just the fact that I know I, I've set that goal and that's what I want to do, but it, but it will give you a pretty substantial bump in pay grade, having your RVT as well as throwing, you know, putting specialty on it as well. Great, that's wonderful, thank you so much, no so much for sharing. All right, Lauren, I'm going to have you come up, I'm going to ask you to grab that uh, surgical suite picture. Oh, oh awesome. Yeah. We have a great image here that was taken at the um, A&M Teaching Hospital, and you're gonna have to hold it really high. Sorry about that. <laughs> this is an image of the sur of a surgical suite, and obviously they are um, doing something to a horse. And I was just hoping, Lauren, that you could just give us a rundown about what we're seeing here. Some of the equipment, what mm -hmm. might be happening, the way the um, technicians and veterinarians are dressed, just anything there that you think might be of interest to our students. Um, so if you guys I'll start on this side of the picture, you can see right here, um, one of the surgeons is at this back table right here. So pretty much anything you see in this picture that has blue like this, whether it's the gown or the table, how can you see that? Right there. Um, whether it be the gown or the table, Jesus. Um, <laughs> it's sterile. So we do like to try and keep as much of our surgeries sterile as possible. So on here is the back table with instruments, um, so the surgeons can go back and forth to the patient and pick up the instruments that they need. So this is a surgeon right here. Um, we do have a lot of different surgical lights in our suites as well. They're hanging right above there. Um, and those can be moved to point to whatever field they need to on the animal. Um, the patient right here is a horse and he is positioned on his back in one of the large trough tables as well. 
Um, and they do, as you can see, they wrap the horse's feet um, just so he doesn't damage anything. They have horseshoes on and they are padded right there. Um, there are also, as you can tell, different technicians and students in here. Um, next to the horse over here, you can see a monitor. Um, it looks like he's hooked up to an ECG right there and they're monitoring his anesthesia. So the anesthesia team is probably on the other side of the horse. Um, something kind of cool if you notice, this is his fluid bag and that's probably a five liter bag right there that they use on horses. Um, when you get to the small animal, they have all the way down to like 250 milliliter bags. So based on the patient size, it's gonna drastically change what kind of equipment um, and maintenance that those patients need. Um, right here, you can tell there's a suction unit that's hooked up um, and there's some blood in there that they're suctioning away from the surgical site as well just so they can see what they're working on easier, um, keep things easier for them. Um, what else is here? As you can tell, um, there are some black cords hanging from the ceiling up there. Those are our oxygen lines that we have hooked up. Um, so it's easy to get to at any time. We don't have to wheel around some oxygen tanks. So we do have central lines running through the hospital that we can hook up to. Um, and then this right here looks like a cautery <coughs> unit. They will use that to control bleeding in surgery. Um, and so it's just an electrocautery unit. They go ahead and just zap those little pesky bleeders with some electricity. Um, and I think that's probably everything important in that picture. <laughs> Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Um, I think we will now open it up to questions. If y'all, if the four of you would like to come on into our camera here, zoom out so we can get everybody in. <laughs> All right, and our interactive sites, you may now unmute your, unmute your mics when you have a question. And while we're waiting on a question from one of our schools, we've got a few here. <coughs> um, so what type of schedules do y'all have? Are they typical eight to five schedules? Are you on call? Um, do you have to come in on the weekends? What, what, what should our high school students expect of their career life when they become veterinary technicians? Well, normally, uh, I would say I usually work a normal eight to five schedule, but there are some days where I'm gonna be on call for different things that help out with the hospital. Like for example, right now I'm helping out with a certain study that one of the clinicians is doing in neurology. So if a patient comes in that qualifies for the study late at night at eight o'clock at night or at two o'clock in the morning, I'll be called in and I have to go to search and go in to do uh, assist with that. Uh, but again, if there's things that are going on past five o'clock that I need to stay and help with, I do. So, I mean, I could be there. I think the latest I've been there is probably around 8.30 or so, but I think Pamela has a little bit more of a stressful <laughs> <laughs> schedule than I do. Yeah, I think it, a lot of it just depends on, on what you decide you want to do. If you're working in a, you know, in a general practice, your hours are probably going to be a little more set you know most places are open eight to five or eight to five thirty some of them are closed on the weekends um, working in anesthesia we're we're the whole hospital is 24 7 the anesthesia service is a 24 7 meaning that if something happens and the university has to close we're essential personnel and we still have to be there um, i i actually worked yesterday um, Went in about 7.30 yesterday morning, left about 6.30 last night, got called back in at one o'clock this morning, and was there till about five o'clock this morning. But, so I'm running on no sleep now, but that's just part of the job that I love, so I know it's worth it. Yeah, schedule. Um, I, I kind of luck out on my schedule, <laughs> honestly. Um, my days are typically eight to five. Um, again, kind of like one, like there will be days that I have to stay late. Um, we don't have, we're not on call as technicians, um, but we're always available by, by telephone. Um, our clinicians many times have called us in the middle of the night saying, oh my gosh, I can't figure out how to run your CT or something to, of that nature. And, and they'll call us and ask us to come in and help. And we, we're more than happy to come and help, um, especially, especially when we need to provide um, better patient care for these animals. That's what it all kind of boils down to. Um, but yeah, eight to five for me, just five days a week, weekends are free. So again, I kind of luck out on that aspect. Um, as far as my schedule goes, it varies based on um, patient load in the day. 
Um, at, for example, every Tuesday, the service that I work with, we travel to and from Austin and do surgeries for them at their shelter. So we leave um, at about 6.45 in the morning and the latest we've gotten back is about 9.30 at night. So they do turn into long days. Um, you can't really rush through surgery. So whenever you're done, you're done and then you go home. So some weeks I'll work only 40 hours a week and sometimes that's three days, sometimes that's five days. And then some weeks you work up to 60 hours a week. And like Polly said, it all boils down to patient care. You want to give your patients the best care that you can. So if that means you have to stay a couple hours extra, you stay just to get the job done and make sure that your patients wake up healthy, happy, and the best possible um, outcome. Do we have any questions from our interactive sites? a certified veterinary technician. We're not going to let Kayla answer that. <laughs> so it kind of depends on what kind of program you want to go through. All of us had different ways that we became veterinary technicians. For example, I went to um, a state university for a couple years and got my most of my prerequisites out of the way and then went to a two-year university um, and got to test out of a few classes, so sped that up a little bit and then graduated. And then it's kind of up to you when you sit for your exams and get all of that done. Um, so it could take anywhere from two years all the way up to four years based on how dedicated you are to get things done. So it's kind of um, a self-driven course, if you would. So it's kind of up to you how long you want to take to get things done. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Any other questions from our interactive sites? All right, we have another question here submitted. Um, how similar or different is working in the private practice, in a private clinic, to working at a teaching hospital like A&M? Uh, I think it's pretty different considering uh, working at the teaching hospital, again, because it is a teaching hospital, you're assisting a lot of fourth year veterinary students with these skills that they're gonna have to learn in the future. Whereas if you work in a private clinic, you don't have to teach anybody. You just, you do all of the work yourself. And again, it kind of goes with the same thing Caleb was saying, when you compare hours working in a private clinic as opposed to a, a public hospital. Um, and just a little caveat to that, I think working in a teaching setting definitely has its advantages. If you're working in a private practice, you know, they'll see most of the run of the mill um, cases and surgeries and things that are easy, but whenever a referring veterinarian has a case that you know they've never done before they're not completely sure of what to do or they just have no idea what's going on they'll transfer those cases to us so we definitely get to see the more critical cases the cooler cases the cases you don't really necessarily see all the time so I think it's definitely an advantage to work in a teaching facility or a specialized facility because you get to see the cooler cases <coughs> and branching off of what you just said there Lauren we had another question about the most unusual animal or case you've seen, so I'll let each of you tell about your most unusual um, either animal or case that, that you've had while at AM. Um, personally, on general surgery, we see it, we're more closed <coughs> off. We normally just see cats and dogs. Um, but the clinician who runs general surgery now used to do exotics at Mississippi State. So we got to do a couple Christmases ago a C section on, um, not a C section, I'm sorry, a pyometro surgery on a tiger. So she came in on Christmas and had basically an infected uterus on a full-size tiger. So we got to do that, and that was definitely a really awesome case to be a part of. Yeah, I actually remember that case because <laughs> we did radiographs on it. Um, <clears throat> I uh, kind of Caleb will probably say the same same thing. We get to we get a handful of just bizarre cases, um, like Lauren said. You know, it, it's not really, most of them run-of-the-mill day cases. We see all of those sh weird, cool stuff. Um, like yesterday, for instance, um, I did a CAT scan on a deer. Um, she had a large mass on her thigh um, that extended up into her pelvis. So they anesthetized her, and we did a CAT scan on her. Um, <clears throat> I've done tigers, um, anteaters, <laughs> kangaroos. Bears, lion, lion and lion. tiger, oh my. <laughs> um, so, and from some of the pictures, if you saw, um, I think there was a reindeer in there. Um, 
So it's, I kind of, I, I, I'm lucky in what I get to do. Of course, like the horses and stuff like that, which I truly love. Um, cows, llamas, sheep, really anything. If it's an animal, bring it to me. I'll, I'll image it if you need to. So that I'm, I'm very fortunate in what I get to do in radiology. Uh, as far as for me goes, uh, the two things that pop out is whenever I was helping out in orthopedic surgery. The first one was a few years ago. We had to do a, a surgery on a potbelly pig, which uh, is a common. We did something called a TPLO, which is a common uh, dog surgery for a torn cruciate. But instead, the owner had a pig that had the same thing, and he didn't. He really cared about the pig, so we did the surgery on the pig. And uh, a few months ago, I remember we did a surgery on a duck that had a very kind of wonky little flipper there. So we attempted to do surgery there, and I can't remember, I didn't see it personally, but I do remember something in large animal, there was a giraffe that came in and had a leg surgery. A lot of, it's a, good, it's a long, long time ago, but that was a pretty good one. Yeah, I think I agree with Holly. I mean, we, we provide anesthesia to the whole hospital, so it, it, everything you could think of, we have, have slept. Um, I, I like doing a lot of the zoo med and exotics cases. Um, they're, they're usually a little bit more of a challenge because not as much is known about them and how they handle anesthesia and, and, and surgical procedures. Um, some of the cases that come to mind that we, we seem to be doing a lot of here lately, we've seen a lot of prairie dogs, um, that Holly's imaged several of them. Um, they're, they're a pretty good anesthetic challenge just because of their anatomy. They're, they're kind of like rats. They have very small mouths, and a lot of times the problems that they have are with their teeth and, and their jaws, so that makes it really hard, like Lauren was talking about earlier, you know, putting the, the trach tube down to, to protect their airway um, can be a real challenge with those guys and, and, and can cause a lot of complications. So, kind of like Holly, you bring it to us, we'll sleep it. How about a snake? We do snakes. Holly doesn't do snakes. <laughs> that's Holly why I do have, snakes either. That's why we have coworkers and we, we call yes. them not it on that. <laughs> yes, we have, uh, we, everybody I think at, at the school, at least in anesthesia that I can speak for, everybody has their little thing that they like to do the most or, or don't like to do. Um, it's pretty well known that I don't like to do snakes, but as long yeah. as it has legs, I'll, I'll deal with it. <laughs> All right, any questions from our interactive sites? We have time for another question or two, maybe. Do you note differences amongst uh, new students that are coming through, the, four, uh, the fourth year students? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I mean it's, it's well known around the hospital. Whenever fourth year, new, fourth, old, old fourth years are graduating, then we have new third years becoming fourth years. But even if not, you definitely can notice a, a shift well, word I'll use a shift in uh, their technical <laughs> skill and how they uh, how they approach uh, the caseload, how they approach different services, paperwork, and just handling all their patients. So you definitely do notice. Yeah. Um, I think that's a definite advantage we have as well working in a university setting. Not only do we get to do things ourselves, but we also get to help mold the future veterinarians that are going to go out and work in other practices. We get to teach them the little tricks um, of the trade, if you will, and help them to become better veterinarians and have better patient skills and things like that. Yeah, I think it's really rewarding also whenever you have the fourth years leave and then you can see how easy everything is for them as handling patients and doing surgeries and it's just, it's, kind of, it's a good rewarding feeling knowing that you help them. All right, so last, last thing, really quickly, what advice do you have for our students out there watching? If they want to pursue this career path, what, what, should, what do you tell, want them to know that they should be doing right now? I would say right now, um, start shadowing, start getting experience. The sooner that you can get experience, the better you're gonna, off you're going to be in the future. Uh, if you have a local veterinarian, I would say go volunteer there. Watch surgeries, learn everything you can from them, and keep in contact with that veterinarian for the future so you can get the recommendation letters, or you can always just have somebody to refer to, ask for help. And um, just, yeah, just the sooner you can get experience and find places to learn more, the better. What about your course load in high school? What should you be taking? Um, I guess, well, for me, um, I, uh, I have sciences, for sure. Um, I did a lot of sciences. Um, anything, any kind of agriculture class you can do, especially like in clubs and stuff, like 4-H and FFA and stuff, um, anything animal related, um, math, 
Uh, I know a lot of people cringe on that one, mm -hmm. but that's truly important, when, especially when you're doing like drug doses and calculations and stuff like that. Um, those are real important. And I would say too, you know, if for some of some of y'all that are not, you know, juniors and seniors yet, you know, if there are classes that you can take like dual credit for that you can, you know, get into your high school, as, but as well as get some college credit, um, you know, start looking at colleges now. There, there's tons of them out there. You know, whether you actually want to go on campus and take the classes, where you want to do distance learning, make sure it's a, an ABMA approved school. See what kind of credits you're going to need, and there's no reason to take a class twice. Do it, you know, take it once, get it for college credit, transfer yeah. it, and, and just don't do like I did and wait till you've been doing this for 13 years and <laughs> try to go back to school. It's a really bad idea. <laughs> um, so try to try to just start now and get through it. And, and like Juan said, find a clinic. That's how I started. You know, I found a clinic back home. Started working there after school and on the weekends and just really enjoyed it. Thank you. Fantastic advice and stories. We really appreciate y'all being here today. Um, remember out there at our schools that we have a website, peer.tamu.edu, P E E R.tamu.edu, which will allow you to um, access the video conference you saw here today, as well as other video conferences we've done in the past. At the top bar, across the top, you'll see videos. If you pull that down, you'll find video conferences, and this video conference will be uploaded there soon. Also, you'll notice the red rectangle with agriculture science lessons. We have full lesson plans, including hands-on activities, PowerPoint presentations, everything you need to know to help you, whether you're teaching the veterinary science course or other general ag courses, and in addition, we have just Teeks Aligned Science courses. So please check out our website and join us for our next video conference. We really appreciate y'all being here with us today, and we hope you have a great day.